are we are going to be hearing from um, uh, from panelists for uh, Marcel's book, Marcel Stoyer Nagel. Marcel Stoyer Nagel um, is the um, assistant professor of church music and director of the Master of Sacred Music program at Southern Methodist University. He is uh, is from Brazil, has published a number of articles in English and in Portuguese, and as I understand, is going to be doing some um, some bilingual presentation this evening. So we're looking forward to that. On his panel are um, are three scholars. Uh, first, Dr. Maria Cornu. Uh, Maria is Associate Director and Program Manager for the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. She is from Buenos Aires, Argentina, where she taught Biblical Studies and was Administrative Director at the International Baptist Theological Seminary. She holds a PhD in Theology from the Free University of Amsterdam on the topic of Protestant worship in Argentina. Secondly, Mark Porter. Mark Porter is a prolific author of, uh, and he has written two monographs so far, Contemporary Worship and Everyday Musical Lives in 2016 and Ecologies of Resonance in Christian Musicking in 2020. Mark is co-editor of an edited volume with Nathan Myrick of Ethics and Christian Musicking, which we are not launching tonight, but you'll get, we'll talk later about the, the launch party for that book. Uh, and Mark is also co-founder and program chair of the Biennial Christian Congregational Music Local and Global Perspectives Conference. Alongside his academic work, Mark is an active church musician who has served as worship leader, director of music, organist, and choir leader for a variety of churches in the UK and Germany. And thank you especially to Mark. Uh, Mark is coming to us from Germany this evening where it is one in the morning. So he is uh, so far winning the, uh, winning the prize for most middle of the night panelist. Uh, and finally, Nathan Myrick. Uh, Nathan Myrick holds a PhD in church music from Baylor University and is assistant professor of church music at Mercer University. He is author of Music for Others, Care, Justice, and Relational Ethics, which we will be launching second, and series editor of Music Matters for Ethics Daily. He's a uh, co-editor of Ethics and Christian Musicking with Mark Porter, the aforementioned Mark Porter. And uh, Myrick, before his uh, the beginning of his academic career, Myrick was a rock musician who toured extensively. He's produced two musical albums and also worked as a screenwriter. So that is an introduction to our first panel. And uh, the, the way that it's going to be structured is that Marcel, Dr. Storenagel will come on, will um, talk for eight to 10 minutes about his, uh, to give an overview of the volume. Then each panelist will talk for about five minutes about their impressions. Then we'll open it up to Q and A. So Dr. Storenagel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ingalls. Um, I want to start by thanking you and thank you, thanking Dr. Myrick for for this opportunity. Uh, I, I, I'm honest when I say that we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the both of you. Uh, queria agradecer a presença dos amigos brasileiros e meus amigos latino-americanos também. Uh, é muito bom ter vocês aqui, é uma experiência única. Uh, e, e poder ter todo mundo junto, assim, para mim é muito especial. I have friends, uh, family from Brazil and from Latin America and here from the U.S. I want to thank my SMU colleagues. I see Dr. Hahn on the screen and everyone else for taking time to, to be here, especially the panelists. Uh, Mark, as, is, as Monique said, it's 1 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Nate. So I'm going to do this real quick because I'm a Q&A kind of person. Uh, and, and I grew up at a, at a time and in a context in which the whole church worship is not a performance thing was was alive and well, right? In fact, I had a rock band for 20 years, and I, I distinctly think that for the first 10 years, we tried really hard to make everyone, make sure everyone knew that it wasn't a performance, when in fact, pretty much was, right? Um, and I remember being an undergrad, and this is a story I tell at the beginning of the book, and I had spent the week working on my conducting patterns, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, and walking on the street doing this like a crazy person. And on Sunday night, I had to, I had to direct our contemporary service, right? And I had spent so much time that week doing this that involuntarily, 
as the congregation um, joined in a chorus, I, I just, I cued them in. It was, it was an instinctive gesture. And I remember being surprised by the response. That's, that's a moment that frames for me how over time, the silos that I put myself in musically stopped making sense. You know, the, the Marcel Brazilian jazz person, the Marcel rock person, the Marcel classical conductor person, the Marcel worship leader person. And in this sense, the book is an autobiographical attempt to reconcile experiences in church music, in concertizing, in composition, in touring, in improvising. I needed a new hanger to hang my, my experiential coat. Luckily, my brother, uh, the other Dr. Storynagel, who is also here and teaches at CU Boulder, exposed me to performance studies because he's a performance studies scholar. And, and Dr. Ingalls, my doctoral advisor, pushed me to tug on this thread and see what ha happened. They helped me realize that there is a theoretical framework and a disciplinary hub to study church music as performance. And here we are today. The book, Church Music Through the Lens of Performance, seeks to do several things. Um, it seeks to talk about church music as performance in a way that bypasses the rhetoric of the worship wars. And for, for those of you uh, no Brasil, in Argentina, uh, the whole contemporary traditional divide and you know people dissing each other because of that, I, don't want, I didn't want to inflame that. I wanted to find a way to talk about church music as performance that was hospitable to whatever kind of church music uh, you might be engaged with. I also wanted to address the reality that church music scholars and practitioners frequently talk past each other when they're talking about performance, whether in worship or outside of it, because they're using the word in a variety of different ways. So one person says performance and you know one person understands this, the other person understands that, and so on and so forth. I also wanted to examine the main interdisciplinary intersections that arise from this conceptual mashup of the study of church music as performance and demonstrate the viability of using this vocabulary, which is both a terminological vocabulary and a conceptual vocabulary, to study congregational music making in a variety of contexts. In Brazil, in Buenos Aires, in Europe, in Asia, um, and I try to accomplish these things using a mashup strategy. Uh, I squeeze my ethnographic case studies and the literature together through the lens of performance theory as a way to provide um, a framework for scholars and practitioners to examine the doing and the being involved in making congregational music in these various settings. And this mashup evolves along a path of concentric circles. I start by talking about ritual and the significance of ritual activity in Christian worship. Then I talk about embodiment. As Richard Schechner, the godfather of performance studies, says, uh, you know, your, your, your body is you, right? This recognition, this acknowledgement of embodiment as who we are and not a robot in which our mind lives. Uh, from there, I go on to this idea that... that Worshippers make worship special in a variety of ways, one of which is music. We, we delimit the specialness of that, of that space, of that time, for the specialness of what we're doing in that particular space and time, and we make it special. That's a concept used by ethologist Ellen de Sanayaki. And within that frame, I examine play and change, and the ways in which we tamper with the music, uh, the term I use comes from the, the, the research of Werner Evel, the Brazilian ethnomusicologist, who talks about messiness. And that's the term I use to describe what church music is. It's all over the place. It's really, really messy, right? So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with performance uh, theory as a concept, um, the idea is that of being and doing, right? Um, the, the, church music as performance is a consideration. It's a, it's a stage on which we all play. And that's true for the usher, that's true for the person at the soundboard, that's true for whoever is on the platform, and also for whoever is in the pew. We do this together, and we perform our faith, we perform community, and we perform traditions, or resist them, which is a kind of performance. 
So that's, that's what the book does. And as I close, I want to read from the, the very last paragraph of the book. If in fact the performance of church music is a larger performance, I offer my work as a contribution to the conversation that surrounds this performance and seeks to interpret it, both from the academic and practicing musician perspectives. The ethnography and theory have demonstrated how practitioners and scholars talk about performance in positive and negative, strict and broad, practical and metaphorical ways. While each of these voices speaks from a particular constellation of assumptions and brings valuable contributions to the table of church music studies, this volume can help address some of the nebulosity that surrounds these conversations by providing a performance vocabulary that is specifically tailored for the study of church music. While I do hope that my work will contribute to these conversations about the larger performance of church music, I do not wish it to be a final word, but an invitation to further scholarship. The music of Christian worship is diverse, fertile, and infinitely varied, and there is much work to be done by those who wish to embrace a comprehensive perspective of its performance. There is room on the stage for other scholars to perform. So in that sense, the, the book is a starting point uh, and not a final word. And it's in that hospitable spirit that I um, offer it as a potential contribution to the study of church music, both from the academic and from the practitioner standpoints. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Storenagel. We will now hear um, responses from our three panelists, from Maria Cornu first, and from Mark Porter, and then from Nathan Myrick. Good evening. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Um, in the first place, I would like to express my gratitude for your invitation to be part of this panel celebrating this book launch. Uh, in my name and on behalf of my colleagues at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, I'd like to congratulate Marcel and Nathan for this remarkable accomplishment. For any scholar, and particularly for young scholars, publishing your work is, is such a crucial step. Uh, it is an intellectual, in our case, a spiritual exercise to share your knowledge and make your research available to a broad audience, establishing your voice in the academic field. Uh, if this is true at any time, it is even more valuable amidst the many challenges this pandemic has brought. So again, congratulations to the authors, uh, also extended to the editors, publishing houses, and to your families as well. Um, I have uh, genuinely enjoyed reading Marcel's book, Church Music Through the Lens of Performance. In it, um, the author expresses his hope that this text may help a variety of scholars studying the music of the church, including, quote, theologians who would move beyond logocentric interpretations of church music, end of quote. I have to confess that I fall within this target audience's scope and that this reading has certainly been very generative to me. Among the many contributions Marcel offers in this book, I like to highlight the following ones. And I'm a preacher, so if I chose three, the three points. Uh, first of all, um, I find remarkable uh, Marcel's ability to develop this hybrid methodology able to create such a rich dialogue between ethnography, practice, the worship life of the church, and theory, through a multidisciplinary critical analysis framed by performance theory. I believe that this approach reflects uh, so well the gifts and uniqueness of Marcel as musician and a scholar, as a man who is passionate about the church and its worship, and also about education and academia. So this book is, is the work of a creative intellectual and a spiritual artist. Second, I, I celebrate the global perspective offered by this book for this text's sake and the influence this research and this author will have on other academics and future generations of scholars. 
as a South American myself, I greatly appreciate not only the inclusion of a research site in South America, but the selection of a case that exposes some of the cultural messiness, if I can borrow your word myself, a little bit out of context here, but the cultural messiness of Protestant liturgical practices in our subcontinent. Marcel resists what could be the more obvious way of dealing with a foreign case study, that is, using it as a contrasting point compared to the North American counterparts. Instead, the author reveals the many continuities between worship practices in both countries and presents contrasting views inside similar contexts. Chapter 4 is a good example of this approach. When I read the title, Church Music and Embodiment, I thought, oh, this is where Marcel will contrast Texan and Brazilian cultures. But no, and I was delighted to find out that Marcel had chosen a different route. He brought into the discussion the worship practices of a new plant, a new church plant in Brazil, as the counterpart of the mother church there. This turn not only resists stereotypes and essentialization, but sheds light on other complexities, such as tradition versus novelty, the influence of social class when decisions on working on worship and culture are made, uh, worship and identity formation, just to name a few. Third, um, I believe that this book or one of these books' main contribution is to the resignification of the concept of performance, deconstructing biases and prejudices that might resist the richness that performance theory offers to the study of congregational music. As someone who uh, is not a musician, but a scholar who inhabits a bilingual world, I keep imagining how these notions could be expressed in the Spanish language in the Latin American context. For many historical and contextual reasons, sincerity in worship has been an unnegotiable value and a marker of Protestants, Evangelicals, and Pentecostal identities. And I think that any world that could translate performance into Spanish is so heavily loaded with meanings that challenge sincerity that I keep wondering about the best language that could help to disseminate this research uh, in the Spanish-speaking world. So perhaps Marcel has already some good ideas in this regard. Thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, your work is remarkable, and thank you very much for your generosity making room today on this stage for us to perform with you. My turn, My turn next. next. So, first, so first of all, of all congratulations, congratulations to myself. myself. First of all, I'll plug my headphones back in. First of all, congratulations to Marcel again on the publication of the volume. It's wonderful to finally see this work make the light of day in book format. Having read through, cited, and commented on various earlier drafts, I find there's so much in these pages to resonate with. Um, and it's already provoked me to think about and reflect on the categories I choose to employ in my own research, the longer term trajectories of this field of study around congregational music, and even the models we use for our writing and scholarship itself. When the first Congregational Music Studies volume was published, Eight years ago, um, Monique, Caroline Landau, and Tom Wagner framed the field through three main words, performance, identity, and experience. And the idea of performance has been central in pointing us towards the lived realities and activities which are utterly key to what congregational music is about. And as scholars, we've stumbled around with this term over the years. Uh, we've been caught in the tensions of the worship wars that Marcel drew our attention to at the start. And it's incredibly welcome then to have a scholar willing to dive headlong into the idea of performance, to open out one of these fundamental tensions within studies of Christian musical activity, 
in ways that are both deeply theoretically engaged and constantly refer back to real people, to everyday experiences, and to the attempts to grapple with the world around that worship is engaged with on a weekly, if not daily basis. And as we've heard, it's a book which thrives on tension, on ambiguity, on messiness and on play. One of the things I'm most drawn to about Marcel's writing is his eagerness to embrace the chaos, to juxtapose, to offer multiple voices, and not always to resolve the tensions that appear through doing so, but to offer them to us and to say, here they are, and let's appreciate that. I'm incredibly drawn to the model of mashup which Marcel uses to structure the book. We learn things, we understand them, and we appreciate them when we bring one thing into contact with another. And this seems not only to be a useful method of scholarship, but an approach to the world which is highly human, highly exploratory, and highly conciliatory in character. And I like that. Marcel offers other gestures towards relationality and boundary crossing throughout the book. His description of a rhizomatic field of scholarship, for example, which is made up of different nodes deployed, not hierarchically, but in networked arrangement. He talks too about an ecological approach to the study of performance, which is interested not just in objects or subjects, but connections between objects, subjects, and contexts. And the past year, if nothing else, has shown us a world in which, in which some of our ecology of interaction is taken away, where lockdowns have placed us into a more isolated mode of existence, from which many of us have then reached out to establish new ecologies of interaction and relationship. Some of our ecologies in interaction have been made visible to us more strongly than ever before, precisely as we have them stripped away. And we begin to see anew how fundamental ecology is to our processes of meaning making, living, and worship. But to go back to this word performance, Mark uses, uh, Mark, Marcel uses work that's built up momentum in performance studies to point us towards some of the key ways in which our rituals function. Um, helping us to understand the experience of embodiment, the role of repetition, patterns of leadership, expression, sincerity, stance, participation, attention, familiarity, transformation, immersion, spectatorship, disruption. I lost count of the number of things he, he opens us out onto. And this is one of the things which performance as a category is so good at doing, not at tying things down to a single easily comprehensive overriding framework, but opening us out onto a massive range of things that are going on. And the three different locations where Marcel carried out field work for the volume initially struck me as a somewhat unlikely combination. How do you write about three sites which are neither completely unified in nature nor strongly contrasted according to a particular ecclesiological taxonomy? And the answer, it turns out is relatively simple. You write about human beings in these congregations who are facing similar questions, but are spinning them in their own particular ways, observing them from slightly different angles and grappling with them with sets of tools that are partly shared and partly differentiated in the same way that all human lives both share something in common and have points of uniqueness. It's not an approach that lends itself to orderly taxonomies, but one which guides us as readers fluidly to see performance refracted from a range of different angles. And I like that too. I could go on, but I, I'm not going to. It's a great book, it's interesting, it's human, it's provocative, and it has the potential to generate a great deal of further reflection in its wake. Um, I congratulate Marcel on its publication and I commend it to all of you to be inspired by his approaches and with them to revel in the beautiful, complex world which is church music performance. It's been told by the host that I'm supposed to unmute myself, so here I am. <clears throat> Man, Marcel, uh, where do we start? 
<laughs> it's it's it, I mean it's, it's such an honor first of all just to be able to to speak on your book here at its launch this is this is such a pleasure but it's it's also this weird kind of uh nostalgic trip for me to be, be reading this again after you know sharing these ideas with you or I'd rather you sharing them with me over a beer or two or you know whatever over the course of four years three years of field work and and uh and study and then after that you know writing it so congratulations it's amazing and uh I'm excited. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so the first of all, what I really what I find so compelling about this is that I also grew up in the same sort of world where performance was this dirty word where you like if it was a performance in church music, then it was bad. Like you just you don't do that. And and I, I know we've discussed this at length, but I, I keep coming back to the, the question of, you know, well, what do we mean when we say performance is bad? What do we mean by performance even when, when we get to, into that sort of dialogical space? And I, I mean, I think that on the one hand, people use performance negatively to say it's fakey or that this is, you know, this is a disingenuous performance or that it's oriented towards the wrong thing or that it's doing the wrong thing, that it's, it's for the wrong reasons. And these these become you know as and as we have said many times these become such ethical questions you know uh, integrity and uh, reasons telos and all these things become ethical questions especially through this sort of performance world that you bring into into this book and what I love so much is the way you answer that you answer that by going to the body and you say that these are the ethics of the body this is how bodies function this is how we do our uh, you know, these sort of interactions, how we negotiate these ethical questions, these questions of, say, uh, integrity or, or telos because of the way we perform, by how we do these things with our body. And that's such a compelling uh, intervention, I think, in that discourse of, well, how do you perform? Like, I keep thinking through how much liberation and freedom there will be for, for practitioners as these ideas get disseminated, when all of a sudden you can start saying, ah, yeah, we, we can perform. It's not about whether or not I'm performing. I'm supposed to perform. Performance is actually what we are all doing in every worship service. And even historically, the officiant or the priest was performing the rite, performing the ritual. This is this is the job of the office. And this is also the job of the performer. And, and so what we're doing in our performance and how we use our bodies is such a critical intervention. And I think it's such a critical way to frame this question and to, to offer something that can move outside of this, these dichotomies that we present. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I really, really like about what you do here is, I mean, and Maria touched on this as well, but, but the whole methodology and, uh, you know, as Mark said, the mashup of using ethnography in this sort of way to, to sort of demonstrate that what you're talking about is not confined by a discrete time and space geographically or stylistically or otherwise, but is rather something that is ubiquitously engaged across time and space in a kind of way, or well, maybe not time, but space anyway in, in the present situation. So that by talking about a church in Brazil and two very dis discrete different churches in Waco, you're able to get a sense of how these questions, these concerns, this this performance question is operating in all of these different times and or these different places, and how this is a I don't want to say universal question, but this is a broad human concern. This is something that concerns people who are doing this, regardless of even their their location or their context or their even denominational affiliation. Um, another thing that I really like that you do is you kind of you use Shoshana Feldman uh, to almost interrogate the way we sometimes use ethnography in, in and I will say, I'll put myself more on the theological side where we, we take the promises that we hear in an interview almost as they are operative or performative uh, to use the, the Austin language. And I think that the way you, you frame sort of that, uh, that caveat and the way you go about it by redirecting our attention back to the body, back to the observation aspects of this. Like, what do we actually do with what we say? Like, the, these, these promises are only promises until they're, they're fulfilled, which again brings, you, brings us back to that ethics of the body question, that, that whole embodiment that is so critical to what you're doing. And so I think these are just, these are, I, mean, I could go on gushing about this for forever, but you have already said that you wanted this to be question and answer based. And I've only got one more minute on my clock. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I will end a minute early for extra questions, but this is, this is a, a phenomenal book and I'm really, really excited to see what sorts of waves and ripples it makes in, in all of the fields that it kind of trades in. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Marcel, for your uh, your overview. And uh, thank you to the panelists for uh, for your response. Um, please feel free, those of you who are um, who are in the audience um, to to use either use the chat or to unmute yourself to ask questions. We've come to the Q&A um, section and um, panelists are uh, also welcome to um, to comment on uh, on each other's um, comments as well. I'd like to jump in and thank Marcel for this work. Uh, in the, the last uh, couple of years, uh, we've been working together uh, in the Dr. Pastoral Music Program. It's uh, one of the issues that has come to the forefront about the program is that it's not just about putting more stuff into people's heads, but it's they're becoming more self-aware of who they are. Most of these people already have the skill set, but they they may not have come to grips with their vocation and who they are within it. And I think Marcel's work uh, about performance uh, bridges that. It's not just an artifact on a page or on a stage. It's, it's about who we are and being self-aware of that in the midst of whoever else is around us. Can you say something about that, Marcel? Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, it's, you know, we've talked about this on and off and then on again, uh, trying to answer the question of how to get students to, in a sense, not only know, but systematize for their own experience and their own benefit, uh, these aspects of the, of, of the experience of church music that um, theology wouldn't normally examine, right? And I, I say that in the book that I think there's two pitfalls, and I'm not the first one to say that. Mark has said that in, back in 2014, that theology has this logocentric penchant, and we kind of feel half satisfied if we analyze the lyrics and then musicology has the artifact penchant where like, you know, if we if we squeeze this musical object through Schenker or Forte or Pearl or whatever, then, you know, we, we will have understood the music based on the notation of it. Um, and I think both of those pitfalls are problematic because they they create these blind spots in the way we we perceive our own experience. Right. And I think there are several uh, and I'm going to try to be quick about this, Michael, but I think there are. There are several stewardships involved here. And, you know, when I talk to students and church musicians, I, I define myself. I define my vocation as that of a, a waiter or a steward. And that's what I am for the church. That's what I was at Hedentor uh, Lutheran Church in Brazil. I'm a waiter. I serve people. Uh, there's a diet of music. And um, in higher ed, there, that stewardship continues. Um, getting practitioners, I think, and many of those at, uh, at, the, at the doctoral level in our program are professionals, uh, some of them in huge congregations. Um, being able to reflect on several stewardships and how they connect, you know, the stewardship of the vocation, the stewardship of the music, the stewardship of the people, uh, the stewardship of the body, um, and that experience within the frame of Christian worship. I think expands our horizon and deepens our understanding of what we ourselves are doing. When I said this was autobiographical, it is, is, it, it is in a sense because um, it, it's, a, it's a pursuit to equip people to have conversations about these nuances that could otherwise be blind spots. Uh, and again, you know, it, it's not comprehensive, it's, it's a starting point. Uh, and I expect it to be collaborative in the, same, in the same sense that the rehearsal of a theatrical work is collaborative or the rehearsal of a, a jazz ensemble is collaborative. Uh, you know, I, so these are kind of expectations that I have in terms of how we move forward. I don't know if I've helped to, we don't want to start discussing curricular review. <laughs> but that would no doubt be fruitful. Thank you, Marcel.
We have a question in the chat from Adekunle Oyeni. Uh, he asks, is there um, similarity between performance and then an entertainment in the context of worship? Thank you, Adekunle. It's a pleasure to meet you, uh, albeit virtually. Um, I think part of this is the, the discourses that we, we have inherited around those two words. You know, we've talked about performance, but the other is entertainment, right? And the idea that if it is entertainment, then it is not worship or kind of this, this I think, in a sense, a false dichotomy that uh, we create because of our concern with the, the ritual efficacy of worship and, you know, the ways our theology promises us certain 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 certainties if we perform certain things in certain ways right um if we take each each either of those words at face value you know, for example entertainment if you take the word entertainment as a word that means that which can bring entertainment or you know some level of engagement um that's a very different thing from how we normally use it and you know uh uh, ordinary language philosophers would emphasize the, the difference in the in the use to how we conceptualize and understand the word. I have a, an ongoing document called The Angry Underbelly of Church Music Studies that's a compilation of people hating on each other in church music studies. Right? You, you know, so people saying, you know, this is entertainment, it's not worship, or that is contemporary worship, so it's not worship, or those, you know, that traditional worship is boring, and it's an ongoing document that I have that I think um, represents the way that we've associated these words. And in the book, I don't make a judgment value about anyone's worship. I'm not saying, you know, to cite a common trope, you know, contemporary worship is more concerned with entertainment. Uh, than it should be. Well, you go back at the literature around 18th and 19th century, you know, gospel hymns, and you might find things that would surprise you in terms of how um, people were thinking about engagement in church music and the importance of grabbing people's attention and the interaction with popular mu music and popular culture, uh, so on and so forth. So um, I don't take a stand. I don't make, I don't make a, va a value judgment. I am calling us to take these words at face value and examine our own biases in relation to our narratives of what justifies or doesn't doesn't justify the kind of, of music that we engage with in church and those are two very different things right um, it's again it's easy to be dismissive I think it's harder to connect your question to what Dr. Hahn um, asked it's harder to examine deeply both ourselves and the other especially in, in, a, in relation to a, a, a very complicated, complex activity that is becoming increasingly complexified due to, you know, these, um, these conditions of neighborliness in which we're mixing hymnals with YouTube videos, with Vimeo videos, with things off Facebook, with whatever someone, PDF someone sent us, right? So that's why I talk about stance in the book. Because I think as a stance, you can lay all these objects um, or these experiences on the table and say, okay, um, what can I understand from these performances instead of who's performing right? right? One of the, one of the, uh, I'll end with this. One of, the, one of the quotes in the book is from uh, a theology doctoral student at Baylor who said, you know, probably all of us are getting something right and a lot wrong in terms of the practices and the, and the rhetorics that justify them, right? So I think there's a humbleness, an ethics of humbleness that comes with the commitment to uh, not answer too readily and instead to examine. And I think that's a big difference. I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll stop there. I'm happy to talk about that further. I don't know if there's time to just quickly come back in on that same question. I think with both these categories of performance and entertainment, a lot of how we... Um, how we understand them is often in re relation to what we oppose them to. I mean, here often performance, the opposite might be considered worship if we're talking about certain discourses. And part of Marcel's work is to say, no, that, that's not the, the oppositional pairing that helps us to 
understand this when we're thinking about entertainment we can put entertainment up against i mean being here in germany the opposite of entertainment music is serious music but we could put entertainment up against participation we could put entertainment up against boring dull music and depending on what we pair it with it will take on a very different role in our imagination uh, and and i think it's so interesting how situation dependent the, these words are and they're both tied into those again those much broader networks of meaning and relationship um, and there's very little here that is ever able to be understood purely on its own it's all coming back to those broader connections well Thank you for those responses and thank you all for your insightful questions. Uh, it is, we're going to move on to our second book in the book launch. Pull up my um, remarks. So our second book is Music for Others, Care, Justice and Relational Ethics in Christian Music. And the presenter, I'm going to go ahead and introduce, you've heard a couple of these uh, before if you are, um, if you've been here, perhaps some are just joining us, so I'll renew the, the introductions. Nathan Myrick holds a PhD in church music from Baylor University and is assistant professor of church music at Mercer University. He is uh, the author of the book under discussion and series editors of Music Matters for Ethics Daily. He's also co-editor of Ethics and Christian Musicking and is co-editing a fest shrift as well in honor of uh, David Music. Prior to becoming an academic, Myrick was a rock musician who toured extensively in the early 2000s. He has since produced two musical albums and also worked as a screenwriter. And uh, Nathan will present uh, 10, 10 minutes or so on his book and then the panelists are as follows. Dr. Bokyung Blenda Im is a fellow and lecturer at the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale University. She received her PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of Pennsylvania. Her work uses racial, musical, and religious scholarship to examine Korean Christians' engagements with Black gospel and contemporary worship music. Through her work, she draws attention to the ways in which uh, Korean and Korean diasporic Christians navigate and contest the normative conditions of trans-Pacific modernity. Our second panelist is Dr. Paul Martins. Dr. Martins is Associate Professor of Ethics in the Department of Religion and Director of Interdisciplinary Programs in the College of Arts and Sciences at Baylor University. He graduated with a PhD in theology from the University of Notre Dame and he specializes in Christian ethics. His research focuses on Soren Kierkegaard, Anabaptist theology and ethics, and issues surrounding Christian articulations of pacifism and just war. His books include Reading Kierkegaard, A Guide to Fear and Trembling, and The Heterodox Yoder. And finally, Dr. Marcel Steuernagel is uh, also a, um, a PhD graduate from Baylor University in church music and now serves as assistant professor of church music and director of the Master of Sacred Music degree program at Southern Methodist University. He is the author of the afore discussed church music through the lens of performance from Routledge Press in 2021. He has presented and published widely in English and in Portuguese. Originally from Brazil, Steuernagel served for over a decade as the worship arts and communication minister at a Lutheran church in Brazil. So with those introductions in place, Dr. Myrick. Well, thank you, Monique. It's, um, it's quite an honor to get to talk about my book and I feel as though I have underprepared to do so, which is like this double injustice. <laughs> so forgive me for my inadequacies. Um, I, I want to say uh, double thanks to Monique though for, for first of all putting this thing together, but also helping me put the, the book thing together <laughs> back when I was a PhD student at Baylor and, and, and when Monique was my dissertation advisor and she read many, 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 too many uh, over caffeinated early drafts of what became music for others and gave lucid and kind yet very constructive criticism and feedback. And so I would just like to say thank you so much for everything you've done and continue to do for all of us. So um, <clears throat> the book for me began, uh, like at least in terms of my thought process, it began in about the fall of 2008 when I was 
touring with the music ministry called CTI Music Ministries. It's now defunct, but it was, uh, if I were to describe it now, I would say it was, it was an intersectional group of young adults who were, were working both out their own faith, but also trying to figure out what musical ministry and missions might look in a post-evangelical sort of context. Um, we, the, we were touring in the U.S., Canada, and some overseas stuff as well. And um, where I found myself in the fall of 2008 was touring primarily in prisons, homeless shelters, rehabs, um, detention centers, and, and other sorts of places that were generally, uh, I would, first of all, I thought was really cool, but also at the same time, were very out of the way and very much off the radar of an aspirational rock and roller. And um, I, I was really struck initially by, uh, well, there, there were a few things, but one place in particular really, really stood out to me. And it was on Vashon Island in the Puget Sound. We're playing, we, we had just played at the um, Riverside Rehabilitation in Seattle. And then we had gone out to play at a small Lutheran church in uh, on the Puget Sound or in the Puget Sound on Vashon, and I stayed with a a, a couple of, of men, and they were they were probably the first LGBTQ Christians that I'd ever spent any like extended time with, and the experience was jarring for me as at the time I was I was would not have been an affirming person. And uh, even though I would like to have thought I was welcoming or something like that, but I, I certainly wasn't, wouldn't have figured out how to be an active affirmer of LGBTQ identity and people. But the hospitality that I was extended was such a profound experience for me. And when I left after, I think we had two days there, they gave me a key to their house and said, um, here, this is, this is for you. If you ever don't have a place to stay, you always have a home. And, 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 and so I still have that key. And what struck me so, so deeply about that was the, the profound relationship that they were willing to enter into with somebody who was doing something and maybe I wasn't even on their team at the time. And, and it, it really jarred my way of thinking not only about ministry, um, but also about ethics. And it just so, you know, it, it, it's more a happenstance that I was doing music, that music became the way that I started thinking about these kinds of things through. I started thinking about um, the way that God relates to us and the way that we interact with God, what we think about God's agency in the world and, and what, you know, how are people made and what kinds of things are, are a part of creation, what things are, are imposed on it and, and so on. And these, these thoughts sort of percolated. They percolated through finishing up my undergraduate degree. I, I'm a two-time college dropout, so this was between, you know, between dropout or right after dropout number two that I was doing this. Uh, and so I went back and I finished up my degree and then I went to seminary. I went to, to Fuller Seminary and I, uh, I was a, a terrible student in undergrad. And so I think I had a 2.78 GPA or something like that. So those of you who are professors, take it easy on your underperforming undergrads. They may, they may still be successes in life. Um, and I, I had to enter the MDiv program at Fuller. And then I, after I got my GPA up over a couple of semesters, I was able to transfer into the MA program. But I, I was looking at, even at that point in time, looking at the way that music informs or participates in these relational uh, ethical formations. And I, at the time I was thinking about it in terms of formation. I was thinking about it in terms of uh, virtue ethics and the, the way that you the communities and individual identities are formed through participation, participation in Christian narratives, participation in communities and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I sort of had these, these rudimentary ideas. And at this point in time, they were more than rudimentary. I was very committed to figuring out what this whole music and ethics thing was. And I remember wandering around, um, uh, this, this was gonna make me sound like Euro trash, but I wandered around Paris with a friend who was a PhD student at UCLA at the time and kind of spilling what I was thinking to her because she was working on her dissertation also on music and ethics. And, and she looked at me, so you're not talking about virtue, you're talking about care ethics. And I went, oh yeah, I, actually, I, I absolutely am talking about care ethics. And so when I got to Baylor, which was the, like actually the following month after this conversation, I started talking to Monique about these things I started talking to her about, okay, so care ethics and music and how might this work? And Monique put me in contact with Elise Edwards. I think Paul also helped with that, Paul Martins. And, and so that sort of got this idea and this way of thinking about Christian ethics and, and music from this very, uh, from what generally doesn't count as 
insider theological ways of doing it. And, and so I, I definitely embraced that in this in the book. Um, I'm, I'm, I've just talked a lot about what happened before the book. I should probably talk about the book a little bit. Um, the book itself takes that realization of relationship and the fact that relationships tend to be valued outside of power structures more so than within or maybe by people who occupy the, the sort of heights of privilege and power. And, and so I use that as sort of the springboard into doing the ethnographic research to talking about people who are talking to people who were either in liminal states, uh, you know, grad students in a sort of uh, out of the way context or people who were just worshiping in a church in Waco. And some of the people who I talked to were also obviously, you know, established people, but I wanted to get this perspective. Or I wanted to think about it from a different perspective. And what I found was, first of all, uh, that music is just inherently, inescapably relational. Even, even if we talk about the lyrics of music, church music as making it good, uh, eventually, in, and by eventually, I mean within a couple of sentences, people started talking about their relationships. They started talking about how, like, the, the way that they sing or what they sing re like, just reframes the way they think about or imagine themselves to be in relationship with other people. And so... Again and again, the refrain of other people starts coming back into this, and um, and, and that works musically as well, right? Music, the music is a relational something. It always exists in relationship to other parts of itself. Or there, you know, if you are a music maker, you are making music either with the memory of somebody else, maybe the person who wrote the score, or the other people who you are thinking about, or you're playing with someone. This is kind of the goal: is to play music with other people, um, if not for other people as well. And so this whole like the the overwhelming ontology, like so feminist theologians and ethicists call this the ontology of relationships that this this overwhelmingly inescapable context of being is to be in relationship and this is so obvious in music and musicologists i think sort of inherently or just musicians even just inherently get this but then to say ah oh, this might actually be a theological claim there's something in here and and so then i went back to reading say the bible or theological works with that hermeneutic in my mind as okay that's a relational claim this is this is about how we frame ourselves both as identities, but also as um, relational somethings in terms of those relationships. But relationships aren't always good. Like we can all think of abusive, dysfunctional kind of, I would say evil relationships. And so this, this counterpoint to the care and relational side of things is that of justice. But what is justice, right? Like, how, like is it quid pro quo? Is it um, some sort of retrib retribution for wrongdoing? Um, could we conceive of justice as a different, a different mode of engagement? Uh, and maybe, maybe thinking through music and help. And I, I, I hope, I think that by talking about restorative justice in the context of relationship and using the idea that Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum uh, developed as the caring, uh, sorry, the capabilities approach to to human flourishing is a, a much more productive and helpful way of thinking about relational justice that is allowing and not even allowing but hoping to ensure and facilitate acknowledging the capabilities of other people and their ability to be who god has made them to be so there's the the big the, the big narrative and the big thought behind the book um, and i'm losing my voice again <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Nate, and the, the background was, was helpful as well. Uh, we'll turn to our panelists with their thoughts on the book. Um, first, uh, Bo Kyung, Blinda M, then Paul Martins, and then uh, Marcel Steuernagel. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this invitation to participate in this panel. Um, Monique, thank you for that wonderful introduction, so lovely. Um, and thank you to Baylor for hosting this event. And major congrats to Marcel and Nate for your publications. Um, it's such a pleasure to provide a response to this fantastic book written by my friend and colleague, Dr. Nate Myrick. Music for others. When Nate first brought to my attention the title of his then forthcoming and now published book, I thought, hmm, it might have been the first time that I'd heard that particular sequential combination of words. Music of others, sure. Musical others, of course. Alterity, exteriority, exclusion and inclusion, 
These are things about which I, an ethnomusicologist who studies Christianity, race, and modernity in Korea and the Korean diaspora, often think and write. Music for others, care, justice, and relational ethics in Christian music presents an innovative, timely, and provocative epistemic framework from which to understand, quote, how music has ethical power and what the results of that ethical power are, end quote. A bold claim is forwarded in musical music for others. According to the author, quote, musical activity discloses what it is to be human, end quote. That is, Relational ontology is the foundation of human existence. Relationships, however, as Nate just briefly mentioned before, are often strained or broken. Thus, the telos is to be for the other's flourishing as humans engage in a shared restorative project of working toward mutual freedom. The self cares for, the self stands with the other, not out of some misplaced notion of charity. Rather, I care for and stand with you because my freedom, and here I might even venture to say my liberation, is bound up in yours. Through insightful words offered in the introduction, four very rich body chapters and conclusion, Dr. Myrick patiently provides conceptual building blocks drawn from music studies, practical theology, and philosophical ethics to forward his argument. And I'll just briefly digress here and say, um, Nate, like your writing style is so friendly and you're such a good guide. You um, are providing these kinds of very solid building blocks to um, create a larger kind of picture. And there's a, a crescendo, I think, that, um, uh, that comes at chapter four. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, four major themes are presented. So Nate first addresses the unstable meanings that accrue in musical genre and discourse in chapter one. He secondly guides readers through the formational role of affect and reason in musical embodiment in chapter two. And thirdly argues for the need to parse care and justice. So in chapter three, for instance, he says, quote, justice read through the lens of care must also have a restorative orientation, end quote. The final body chapter I found to contain the, the central theological kernel, and I might even say conviction, that fuels music for others. I found Nate's reverse reading of passages from the New Testament book of Matthew chapters 22 and 25 particularly constructive. He states, quote, we know what love is because we have been loved by other people, end quote. And, quote, any claim cannot be orthodox if it is not always also characterized by orthopraxis and orthocardia. I do not, cannot love God without loving my neighbor and accepting my neighbor's love for me, end quote. I highlight this particular passage for interrelated reasons. It is one great feat to interweave insights from ethnomusicology, liturgical studies, and relational ethics as a scholarly project. And of course, Nate does this brilliantly. But it is quite another thing entirely to articulate and forward one's own ecclesial theology in the same book. And in so doing, Nate practices that which he proposes. He boldly and vulnerably allows for the surfacing of a scholarly identity that unsettles the boundaries between knowledge formations that have conventionally been defined as sacred and profane in the Western Academy. The monograph is addressed to both specific and general academic readerships. On a primary level, a strong and necessary critique is quite specifically directed at church music scholarship that, when considering music's efficacy in Christian congregational contexts, has been a little too dependent on lyrical analyses and concerns over so-called theological orthodoxy. Nate reveals that such narrowly focused discussions have bypassed altogether serious consideration of everyday congregants lived ethical religion. For Nate's interlocutors, embodied emotions and the ways in which those emotions are heterogeneously experienced are constitutive of the self's inscription, the self in relation to other, the self's phenomenological and ethical reality. 
But the intervention of music for others can be extended much beyond church music studies as such by placing emphasis on the body as a site of affective and meaningful convergence. Nate speaks to the wider materialist turn in religious studies, which acknowledges the limitations of the linguistic fallacy and centers the ways in which affect, emotion, and embodied knowledges constitute both human and non-human life worlds. In a way, Music for Others does not seek to solve problems that modern congregations face in debates over musical style and genre. Rather, and I think this is what makes the book so compelling and offers such explanatory power, Nate directs attention to a wholly different framework from which to understand how music works in Christian congregations. As such, he challenges his readers to reorient our thinking around a liberatory, caring, and just relational ethics. Nate, it's a total page turner. It's both sharp and generous. Congratulations. Well, th thank you, Monique. It is an honor and a, and a pleasure to be here this, this fine evening, afternoon, whatever it is. Um, Nate, uh, very well done. Um, there was many days I didn't know if this day would happen um, for, for several years. Um, I, I will say a couple of things very quickly. I have three observations and then two questions. You know, of course, I'm going to ask you questions. And it has been far too long since we sat down and, and talked about metal. So maybe another day that will happen. But first, the first observation is simply this. Um, this is incredibly well written. Um, it's ambitious, synthetic, and um, articulate. And it's much better than a dissertation. That's not to say anything negative about the dissertation, but, but it's much better. And the maturation of your thought has come a long way, even in the last couple of years. And I do think it feels very much like you get to say what you want to say here um, in ways that you haven't, I think you've, you've been wanting to, you wanted to say for a while. So that's his first observation. Uh, it's, I really enjoyed reading it. Secondly, and I think, <clears throat> although you have, you've named very, very generously a, a lot of influences here, uh, I think I want to highlight um, the uh, Elise Edwards fingerprints here. It seems to me that um, they're all over, and that is excellent. That makes this book uh, much, very good. Um, inevitably, um, your book is heavily oriented towards the North American context, um, but you have learned well how to give kind of a careful and sensitive attention to marginalized and underrepresented voices in the church. And I am impressed with how this book embodies the care that it invites. So that's um, another kind of, I think it's been mentioned already, but I think the, the book embodies exactly what it calls for in, in very helpful ways. And thirdly, and this gets to not so much musicology, but to the kind of the theological and ethical questions and, and kind of argument uh, underneath the, the, I mean, within and also underneath the text. I really do appreciate your reading of the 20th century, 21st century um, ethical tradition. Um, from loving the neighbor back to loving God, from Levinas to Bonhoeffer to Gustafson to H. Richard Niebuhr. Um, your attention to the re relationality between people and the relationality between oneself and God is, is very fruitful here in your relational ontology, um, says a lot in multiple kind of discourses and in multiple kind of disciplines. And I think you've done this work very carefully. But this leads me to the first question I want to ask you. <clears throat> and, and I'm asked this question not, I don't mean, I, it's an open question. And so I'm asking it because I, I want to hear you, you think and talk about this a, a little bit, a little bit further. <clears throat> and then it's related to the relational, relational ontology of, of the previous observation. So in the continued reflection on the I, thou, um, relationship in Christian ethics in the discourse more broadly. The logical conclusion ends in Levinas, and you pick this up in a variety of ways and you, and you reflect on Levinas. Yet, <clears throat> I think it's also important to note in the historical development of this trajectory that Levinas is the first, um, and, and Derrida, like him, uh, essentially collapses every thou into an abstract human thou in the sense that <clears throat> what we have is, at the end, all vows are human and desacralized. And so I wonder, 
I, I want to hear you say more, given, and I, and I want to also say, I'm very sympathetic, and I'm affirm the way you've constructed this as a, as a kind of corrective and, and a way to address a bunch of excesses um, historically, and I think that's really right. But I do want to ask, um, at the end of the day, and your book doesn't claim to answer this, but it begs an answer. Um, where does your end up, your argument end up in relation to God? Uh, is there a sense in which we eventually do get back to um, an ontology, a uh, relational ontology between humans and God? Or, or have, have you provided a narrative that collapses this and it's per precisely that's where our performance is and that's kind of all that matters? I don't think you think that, um, but I wonder if what you say here can be read that way. And so I, I, and I, I offer that as a, as a, as a, a friendly question, um, but, but a question that and I think um, emerges as you, as you think about this. And then one last question. Um, this is both a book about uh, identity making and identity destabilizing. Um, and, and music is involved in both of these. <clears throat> and it's also then a book about that helps make sense of why monocultural worship um, communities are so attractive uh, in, in all kinds of ways. And, and there's all kinds of ways that question can be approached and, and you, do, you do that well. And yet you, you try to address this through justice and care and, and, that, and I think you do this very, very well. But my question is this, <clears throat> And I think this would be answered differently in different contexts, but I think it's also a question that kind of begs for a kind of a, it's a general uh, a treatment one way or another. How far can Christian music become open to revision, open to care, or, or open to justice and performatively before it becomes inauthentic for a community? And there's a sense in which you could think about this in the Waco context. Um, how far can Lakeshore stretch in relation to uh, the greater Ebenezer before it ceases to be Lakeshore or vice versa. And are there something, I mean, we're not gonna even talk about cowboy churches here, uh, although one is very tempted, but there's a sense in which how far do you imagine that this, that this care and justice can stretch before communities become inauthentic to themselves? And so those are again friendly questions. They're they're not they're not they're not meant to be uh, uh, fatal in any ways. But they're questions that after I was finished and and all the great things that are accomplished here, I, I I wanted to hear you talk more about. And so since we're talking more about it, um, I wanted to ask you today. Thank you. Can I can I go ahead and respond before Marcel comes in? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank Paul. Thank you. First of all. Um, point out one, like good call on Elise. That was exactly why I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, and the second thing, those uh, that American theological ethics thing was from a seminar that I took with Paul. And so of course he's got the, uh, he's got the inside track on that thinking. <laughs> and I definitely got some good feedback on the seminar paper that I wrote for him that formed part of, uh, part of the sort of framing for that chapter. So um, Paul, Paul's got an inside track on this. Those are, those are questions that I was really hoping somebody would ask. Um, and, and I'm going to I'm going to qualify my responses by saying that in some ways these are still the operative questions that I'm that I'm wrestling with and in some ways I'm also as I'm as I'm resolving them uh, I'm finding myself moving in in different theological directions that are in some ways much more safe than I guess I wanted to be but in other ways much more radical and unsettling so uh, I, I hope that I hope that that is uh, true and obvious as my as I go through answering these. I tried to write down all your questions, and so you're going to have to remind me of them since you know it's like you're like I'm on my dissertation committee again or something. Um, <clears throat> okay, so first of all, you ask you know, and you you rightly point out that the I thou dichotomy eventually and especially in the continental philosophers collapses into an everything is a thou. There is only an I and a thou. Um, and which in turn, of course, leads to this desacralization of everything. If, there, if nothing is profane, or if rather, if everything is sacred, then nothing is sacred because sacred in, like, in essence or by definition depends on an other to frame itself against. This is the existentialist dilemma, right? You know, how, how much can there be an I until there's a thou and the distinction therein is, is determined. 
and in in a sense i want to go more with the, the sort of john caputo like there isn't it's not an existential it's an insistent sort of thing it's it's that i don't exist without you not in differentiation but in relationship and in the way that we negotiate our relationship as either just or unjust i.e abusive and exploitative or affirming and, and, and oriented towards your flourishing, your well-being, your ability to become the person and continue to be the person that you both wish and were designed for. Now that does, that, and then that does lead into your next question. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I should not skip over the sacralization question because um, I'm not against desacralizing things. Uh, I, I do think that from uh, the perspective of history, you can look very clear. I, I actually did this, this is odd. I did this with two of my grad students today in, in a class uh, at Mercer. We talked about the origin of the sphere sovereignty model and the idea that you can have different ethical obligations or duties within the different uh, spheres of society that you, you inhabit, the whole Abraham Kuyper thing. And um, we, we went through that and I said, look, in so many ways, this just, and this is me saying this, I said this to my students, but I'm saying it now. In so many ways, this is a construct that allows the perpetuation of empire and the collapse of Christianity into empire in these sort of exploitative ways. And we went out, we talked about coffee. We talked about how coffee trade becomes this, on the one hand, it is a, um, there's a better term for this, but right now all I can come up with is a self-serving, self-perpetuating mode of empire build, building and being that you need the coffee, the coffee drives the empire, which in turn drives the need for coffee. And so you, you continue to perpetuate these exploitative empirical uh, ideas because of the sphere of say economics, coffee and business, right? So different, different telos, I mean, to use this, that term I've all been using tonight, but also drives this sort of thing. So if we move out of this sphere sovereignty model, if we move out of business versus religion or politics versus you know, uh, marital relationships and we start asking questions about uh, actual relational justice, relational equity, relational um, agency, well, then we start saying, okay, we actually maybe need to find different ways of drinking our coffee. Maybe we need to stop going to Starbucks. Maybe we could you know, get an AeroPress and spend a little bit less or spend a little bit more on our coffee beans um, and maybe not drink as much coffee, but have a little better sense of our process and, and understanding our way of being in a relationship with these people, even over a great distance. Now, that's very naive, like probably a better book should be written on that. Um, but that's, that's where I come down on the question of sacralization. I'm, I'm not for it. I don't think we need sacralization. I think it actually, more often than preserving the purity of the thing that's being sacralized, it actually perpetuates the, the arena in which the unjust actions of power are allowed to flourish on their own unchecked. So that's my, my answer there. Now you can come back and say, well, do we lose the, you know, the, if we lose the autonomy of say church and state or the separation, then, you know, then it's zero sum Nietzschean power struggle of, you know, who wins, right? So this is why I say relationship is still that intervention. This is still the, the thing we need to be orienting our, our, our object or excuse me, orienting our agency and our energies towards. So that is probably a much longer conversation and I shouldn't have opened that box. <clears throat> The other question is the one about authenticity. And at what point do like does a community move beyond the bounds of it, the integrity of its identity? Um, I think on the one hand, I myself have operated under or in a poverty of thinking about identity. Um, I start to think about identities as being these very rigidly, like densely, closely held constructs. And I will point that. I'll point to my fundamentalist upbringing, this idea that belief is this core tenet of your identity and you can't lose that belief and then you lose who you are and the whole thing comes, you know, comes apart, which isn't all that bad. A collapse isn't the worst uh, bit of thing that can happen to a person's identity. Um, but I'm also, uh, I think authenticity also serves that empire. It, it's, it very easily becomes the modus operandi of an entirely huge conglomerate industry machine. Like say the you know the celebrity of uh, of worship leaders. My goodness, the billion dollar industry, multi billion dollar industry that 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 generates and that serves. That's a huge huge reason for that kind of perpetuation and the fact that you need to be this kind of this kind of authentic to make it happen. So that's partially doing the the word attack. You know, picking on the word and you're actually talking about the limits of being. At what point do you stop being who you are? Um, but anyway, this is. The, going to go a long time. I need to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Storenagel. Thank you um, for
for for those considerations, Dr. Martins and 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 Blenda for your Dr. Eam. I don't know how do you how am I supposed to phrase the name with the is it Dr. Eam? Is that what your students call you? Yeah, Dr. M. Okay, um, for your for your comments and uh, you know it's hard to tell sometimes where where I end or Nate begins or the other way around because so much of so much of our, of, and I think I can speak for both of us when I say so much of our work is ping pong, uh, you know, and, and it is the result of hours and hours sitting in the doctoral office at Baylor or at the Dancing Bear or anywhere within <laughs> within that world, just kind of like bouncing ideas off of each other. And I do really think that in a sense, Nate's book starts where my book ends. Uh, if my book ends with this case for the acknowledgement of the experience of church music as performance, then the question is, what do you do with that performance or in that performance? So um, that's where, where Nate's work, I think, in a sense, nuances and highlights some of the eth ethical implications and responsibilities of that stewardship or of the multiple stewardships that I was talking about um, before. And... I like, I also like what he's not doing. <laughs> you know, he says uh, on page 21, I'm not attempting to determine which musical styles or genres are or not ethical and so on and so forth, which is again, something um, that I said. And, and I think it's important when he makes that explicit because it removes this work from that constellation of books that are prescriptive about, you know, what your church needs to do to, you know, please God or whatever. Um, it, it goes much deeper. Um, and I think that's important, and it's important, Nate, that you that you say that, because based on based on that stance, I mean that stance allows you to to move forward in directions that I think are necessary and relevant. And you know, we share a lot of questions. Again, maybe just the result of so many hours of conversations. For example, in chapter one, the, the concern with the significance of music and human experience in general, and Christian congregational music in particular, um, which become particularly clear on page twenty five to twenty eight, but. What happens after we acknowledge the, the embodied experiential nature of church musicking, right? I'm, I'm going to use the verb here. Um, and then you go in directions that I think are really important to examine the, metanic, the, the mechanics, the implications, and the consequences of the ways we worship. Uh, affect, affect is a part of this. And, and I do deeply appreciate your engagement with the concept uh, when you say an essential part of music's way of being in the world then is its affective power as expression, as invocation, and as space for emotional interaction with others. On page 52. You know, little gems like these. I could teach a week of seminars on, on, on that, on a question that reverses into bullet points, that reverses into questions. that rever So, you know, uh, seeing the potential of, of the book's clarity and friendliness, um, like Dr. E mentioned, I think is important because it, it, it also shows you the potential of the book to elicit further conversation. Um, and the fact that you focus on experience and the, I think that's what the ethnography helps, helps to do is it removes ethics from you know, the ivory tower and into the worship space uh, with all its greediness and its rubbing of shoulders and its people you know, uh, smelling each other and stepping on each other's toes. Or remember, at least it was before COVID. Nowadays, you know, everything is screwed up. So it's a different world. Um, and and I, I like that, that in, in this process of nuancing, you advance what I consider to be fundamental questions of um, an ethical investigation of church music scholarship nowadays. Right, so if Dr. Randall Bradley wrote about hospitality in From Memory to Imagination about a decade ago, when, when you go into hospitality on pages 77 to 80 or, or that, little, that little bit, uh, you're, you're taking it further in connection with the framework that you've critiqued and constructed in ways that make it radically helpful. Uh, and I deeply appreciate that, especially because I have to finish, finish a paper on radical hospitality. So. Much appreciated. Uh, these convergences uh, and the way that you take these these themes and steward them further uh, do great service both both to academics and and to 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 scholars. And you arrive at a place where you can say on pages you know I'm not going to read the whole thing, but page 91, 
Congregational music then is ethical when it enables human flourishing for each individual in the community. And, and you go on with a list of what this ethical congregational music might mean in experience, which is great, but I deeply appreciate that you don't stop there. You, you, cri you crystallize the ethical intention into a compelling invitation with potential markers of what that ethical Christian music might look like. And it's not a 10-step program for ethical music making, but more of a covenantal stance, uh, more of a, a way of, of making m music in church and thinking about that making. So on page 92, you say, I contend that a musical ethic of care is one that pays attention to the relational and, and affective discourses that music embodies and seek simultaneously to leverage those powerful discourses towards human flourishing, you know, so on and so forth. You know, y'all better read the book. But that, again, that next step or the step beyond the intention uh, is, is helpful because it, again, allows us to think about the ethical frameworks, but also about the implications of the intention in practice. And I think there's a, a potential for great impact, not only in academic circles, but you know, I kept I kept thinking, hey, this would be a, a, a Sunday school worship morning reading book for, you know, an upper level uh, Sunday school. It may be a little bit daunting, but doable uh, and important, I think, if they have the, the engagement for that. So, you know, I just think we should market these books together, do like a package deal or something, because the fact that they... <laughs> The fact that that they're um, that they're tied, and the fact that you take the ball and run with it in a direction that is radically important right now. I mean, I can't overemphasize how crucial that is, given the context that we're living in, and the questions about what it means uh, to make music in church. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. And uh, we have time for maybe. Um, a quick question or comment, and I would invite um, Doctors Storenegger and Mars and uh, and Myrick to put their if you have codes for uh, for people to put those in the chat. Discount codes from the publisher. I do have it if I can find it. Otherwise, I'll send it to everyone. We have um, we have Nate's code here. Yes, thank you, from OUP. Yeah, academic. Friends, I'm trying to find my code again. If I can't find it right now, I will get it to you all. I should have it. No worries. Um, well, I have a few uh, bits of before we we go this evening. If you enjoyed, um, benefited from. Um, this evening's conversation and would would like to hear more. There are a couple of events coming up this summer that are completely online. The one, um, uh, so one focuses more on the practical dimensions of church music making. The other is more an academic conference. So the first event is the Baylor uh, Alleluia Conference. It is the 19th annual. I have put the uh, the link to it in the chat. If you uh, know people, um, and again, because it's online, and now not limited to a place. Anyone can log in from anywhere in the world. We would love for you to join us um, at Baylor in mid-July. The Alleluia Conference is um, designed to equip and inspire ministers in all areas of their ministry, uh, music ministers in particular, um, and at this conference, participants, um, you know, find answers or advice for their own church situations from experienced practitioners. There are uh, sessions on children's choirs, choral conducting, band-led worship, organ, piano, technology, discussion panels, and on and on and on. So I would encourage you to visit the, uh, to visit the website and to, to be part of that. And then the second event that I would, um, would, 
love to invite you to is the Christian Congregational Music Local and Global Perspectives Conference that is typically in Oxford, unfortunately, um, because of the uh, pandemic situation. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, um, we're excited to offer a what we hope will be a um, you know a stimulating and interestingly designed um, program that has both pre-recorded talks as well as live sessions. We're going to have a lot more um, music making and by people who are experts at actually getting people involved over Zoom. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot of um, work <laughs> as well. So if you want an academic, um, academic challenge, come on uh, the first week of August this year for uh, for that conference. But those are a couple of, of upcoming events that, that we would warmly invite you to come out for. But just in closing, want to thank um, Dr. Nathan Myrick and Dr. Marcel Stuart Nagel for producing such, um, such wonderful and thought provoking books. Thank you to all of our panelists for your uh, insightful comments and for highlighting so many of the riches that, uh, that these books have to offer us. And um, it was a pleasure to see so many of you. We hope that you have a good evening, morning, afternoon, middle of the night, wherever it is that you are. And God bless you.